Well, we're pretty much at the, the hour now, and since the room is so full, Am I audible? Fantastic. Am I? Great. Um, so we're going to be giving a talk on mastering data access with Optic API and template-driven extraction. Before we get started, I have a public service announcement to make. Uh, at the advanced semantics workshop on Thursday, the hands-on workshop, there are still a few spaces left. So if you really want to get down and gritty and you know, take your Mark Logic semantics skills to the next level, uh, that workshop will, will do the trick for you. Silo Games, how may we disappoint you today? Damaged in shipping? Let's see. Return for replacement. So, dear customer, just return your product for replacement. How satisfied were you with your support experience? You already returned. Well, I, I didn't know. No shipping is a different department. Well, I can make a note in the support database, but shipping won't see. Hi, Kayla. You've reached the shipping specialist at Integrated Games. Are you calling about your return strategy game? I can see that. Unfortunately, it's on back order. To make up for the delay, shipping will be free the next time you place an order. In fact, that credit is already in your shopping cart. So I'm Eric Hennem. I'm principal engineer with Mark Logic. And for Mark Logic 9, I worked on the Optic API. So I'm Faith Saliba. I'm staff engineer at MarkLogic, and I'm the technical lead for the template-driven extraction feature. And the point of that little uh, role play that we started out with was a classic situation of an organization where they find themselves in one situation, they're in that siloed situation, and they want to transform themselves into an integrated organization. So. That original version of our game maker uh, are in this situation. Um, they don't know their customer. They can't engage effectively with their customer. Uh, they don't know when someone's calling on the phone, whether it's the same person that's in their customer database. They don't know what products they've ordered before, um, whether this is a high value customer. And it's not because they don't have the data. They do have the data. It's just all in different databases. Uh, the customer report database, uh, customer relationship management database has the contact information. The ARP database has the inventory records. The support database has the support interactions. The best way to solve these kind of integration problems is to do it inside the database. The premise is that to make data consistent, you have to understand the data. And that's something that can only be done in the database. So ingest the data, start getting a value immediately, and continually refine and make the data more consistent as needed to support your applications. What MarkLogic 9, a couple of the things MarkLogic 9 is adding to that story is the ability to project different views out of the data using lenses out of your documents so you can support different applications and an API to integrate that information regardless of the representation. So this talk will be focusing on those aspects on serving up the data. Uh, the previous talk was on uh, the aspects of ingesting the data and making it consistent iteratively uh, for these purposes. We're not going to cover the ingest consistency harmonization part. Uh, if you didn't catch the previous talk, I uh, would encourage you to, to follow up on uh, the recording uh, to see it. So the, the result of the ingestion of, of the consistency uh, is an entity model. And this is a typical 
inventory uh, entity model where we have customers who place orders that have line items representing products and we have issues associated with orders and events in the history of resolving an issue. Um, so probably some of you out there have inventory models along these lines or other entity models uh, healthcare it might be patients and procedures and so on. So our game maker company, the kinds of questions they need to answer to get to another level of customer engagement, um, they really need to understand uh, the customer. They want to be able to route incoming calls to the appropriate specialist, someone with a background to answer the customer's question. Uh, they want to be able to look up supplier-specific detail about products uh, to be able to improve their engagement. And they want to be able to review transcripts of interactions with the customer so they can make sure that premier customers are getting uh, an appropriate level of service. So here's how it works. Uh, in MarkLogic, it always starts with a document, in this case a structured XML or JSON document. And templates provide you with lenses where you can project different representations out of the document to support different kinds of queries. So you can continue to query the document as a document using search, um, but you can also project out the consistent structured data that's in the document as rows uh, and perform SQL-like queries over it. You can also project triples out of the document to support relationship traversal, uh, graph operations, and really strongly typed information that is more ad hoc than the ancient rows. The Optic API gives you, uh, unifies these query methods. So you can take advantage of all of the representations available and still have a unified query uh, to meet your application needs. And your optic is. So on the left, what we're looking at is a JavaScript optic query, elided. And you can see immediately uh, that it's standard JavaScript syntax that any JavaScript programmer will look at this and will understand what's going on. We're, we're chaining calls to build up the query. Um, so we start with a view. We're getting our rows out of a view, from a view. Uh, we can apply a filtering condition. We get the rows where a condition is true. We select the columns that we want to work with. We can join on another view, specifying the join keys. We can group on a key and calculate aggregates over the, de the detail, the lines, the rows within the group. And we can apply more filtering conditions, order, limit, and so on. So you can see that the semantics of these operations are all familiar from SQL. Um, but the order of operations is not constrained. SQL tries to simulate uh, an imperative statement, a sentence starting with a verb uh, and continuing with clauses. And so when you, uh, you only get one shot at any clause. Um, when you need to have a more complex operation, which is actually pretty typical, you're driven to subqueries. Uh, with Optic, the order is not constrained. You just lay out your query in uh, the order that reflects your actual logical query. A couple other differences with SQL, you can see we're not concatenating strings together here. So you're not working with two syntaxes, you're working with one. Uh, you're not at risk for injection attacks. And you can take advantage of the programming language to modularize your query. Uh, so you can build parts of the query in functions or transform a query in functions. Um, I will point out uh, also that, that Optic is not a uh, generator of SQL. It's not a generator of Sparkle. It uh, has the same engine under 
Sparkle, SQL, and Optic. And Optic, where SQL and Sparkle are defined by standards bodies, so they're kind of a least common denominator across vendors. Optic is really the Mark Logic, idiomatic Mark Logic biased interface into the Mark Logic engine. So its job is to expose uh, the Mark Logic, the capabilities of the Mark Logic engine in the most convenient way. So for our game maker, when they want to answer the question, which customer ordered the most products, uh, they can take advantage of relational operations for joins and aggregates. When they want to find products based on supplier-specific detail, they can take advantage of document query. And when they want to review the support interactions with a specific customer, they can join the chat transcript for an interaction along with the row information so they get really a complete view of how they, they were working with the customer. Okay, conceptually, so I mentioned we uh, start with documents and we get rows out of the documents. And conceptually, here's how it works. Uh, in the simplest case, the keys for a proper, in this case, a JSON document. So the keys for the, the properties in the JSON document are equivalent to the columns for which we have rows. And the values of those properties are equivalent to the values of the columns in the row. So we have projected the row out of the JSON document into a view. This is a gross simplification. Uh, you have much more flexibility than this. You can project multiple views out of a single document. You can project multiple rows out of a single document. You can combine multiple properties in a single column and so on. But conceptually, this is what's going on. And because this is happening um, at index time, you are not making a commitment to the index representation when you persist the document. You have the flexibility to change that in a very flexible way. Well, now that we have customers rows and we have order rows, we can answer that question, which customer placed the most orders? And we do the, the way you would expect. We do a relational join on the rows and we can group on the customers uh, and do calculate aggregates such as counts and sums over the, the order detail and find out uh, which customer placed the, the uh, most orders. But we're not giving up the other capabilities, the ability to treat, uh, process our rows in the context of our documents. Um, so here we are looking at a set of products rows. Here's the uh, product for a specific, from a specific supplier. And you'll notice there's some detail in the JSON document that's not in, in the projected rows. That's because each supplier is going to have a different substructure that reflects the detail about their product. They're not going to collaborate and come up with a standard. Um, so we're not able to, to project detail in, as a consistent column. But it's still very valuable information. It's information that we don't want to throw away. We want to keep that information with us. So one of the ways we can use that information is by doing a document query. So if we query on a term that appears within the detail, we can filter the rows to only the rows that come from documents, that have source documents with, that match the query. So a query on the documents can filter the rows. And that's extremely powerful. That means that the ad hoc freeform information can still play a part in your selectivity when you're working with rows or triples, I might add. Another way we can work with documents and rows together is with document joins. So in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, events uh, that happen in the history of resolving an issue. And some of those events have chat transcripts, but certainly not all. Um, and it would never make sense to try to shred the chat transcript and stuff it into rows. That's not that, it's a free form document, even though it's a structured document. 
and a valuable document. But what we can do is put the URI of the document into a column in the row. And now we can join, dynamically join the document with the row. And so we have a column that has a document as its value. And we can do XPaths to extract fragments of the documents and so on. Um, now, an important point here, I want to make sure uh, this is kind of a, uh, something to be aware of as a best practice. Uh, access to data in indexes is always faster than accessing uh, documents. That's the purpose of indexes. Um, so it's not a good idea to retrieve vast numbers of documents and start performing operations on them. Uh, the better approach is to work with rows and triples, get down to the set of entities that you really want to work with, and then join the documents uh, so that you, you uh, 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 work with the data uh, that you can access efficiently uh, as part of your selectivity. And when you really need to work with a large number of documents, you page over them, which you can do by, by changing the offset. OK, thus far, we've been looking at the query capabilities of uh, the Optic API. It's time to dig a little deeper into how the indexes work and how uh, the projection into the indexes work. And with that, let me hand off the baton to uh, the man who knows about TD more than anyone. Thank you, Eric. So, so now let's take a look at um, uh, some of the uh, new indexing features in MarkLogic 9 and how they can help uh, our gaming company transform itself. Um, uh, Template-driven uh, extraction, or uh, we refer to it as a TDE, um, is a new way to define or, or to declare how you want to index different types of documents. It's also the underlying mechanism that uh, allows developers allows developers. Uh, to create a relational lens or semantic lens over the uh, data documents and then make those documents available in SQL, Sparkle, or the new Optic API. And here's some uh, customer 360 challenges that we try to address with uh, template-driven extraction. Uh, quite often, um, you'll see that uh, in general data have a lot of um, different uh, downstream uh, consumers. Uh, for instance, a customer director or a customer support agent would like to query the data differently. They'd also like to answer detailed questions that require a gran granular view of their data. And they also want to be able to aggregate um, and do queries across uh, different types of entities or different types of uh, documents that are structured differently. Um, and what that implies is that TDE need to be able to support uh, multiple views. It needs to, be ha to handle uh, repeated data and it need to have some type of limited uh, transformation during indexing. So before we go at, at, and take a look at how a template uh, really works, uh, it's important to understand where the template generation really fits in uh, your workflow. And if you've seen the previous talk on entity services, uh, you probably know by now that you, your entity model is uh, your gateway to uh, generating templates. You can auto-generate templates with uh, entity services and from the entity models. Um, but what we'll focus uh, here is we'll focus mainly on the advanced way of building uh, a custom template from scratch, or if you'd like, if you want to even fine-tune the auto-generated templates. We'll also show how templates can project data uh, project of rows and triples uh, from documents. And we'll also demo some of the powerful features uh, like transformation or aggregation in templates. Uh, so here's a simple uh, sample document that represents an order entity. And uh, usually documents are very good for um, uh, modeling data that's really complex, uh, very rich, uh, doesn't necessarily fit into a well-known schema. Um, but at the same time, some of the data that you've modeled uh, could be a really good fit for a relational view. And what we'd like to do in this case is uh, we can see the orders document that has some customer information, some shipping information, and a sequence of different products that's part of the, uh, the order. And we'd like to be able to construct an orders view 
and populate the rows using the data that's in the documents. And the way to do this in MarkLogic 9 is to define a template. So this is roughly how a template uh, looks like. Um, it's uh, it basically defines how to go from the document and grab pieces of data inside the document to populate the rows. Uh, a template is basically a JSON or an XML document that you can add to uh, the server. Uh, it always has a context, and what the context uh, defines, it defines uh, a starting point in your document uh, that tells you um, what is the data that you want to uh, pull out of the document. Um, it also defines a view and a schema, and it, a template it will cr create automatically create the view for you if you haven't created it through another template. And the most important part is the column mapping, uh, where you really define, uh, you can see we're listing the different columns, and we're showing how we'd like to map the different data, for instance, ID and customer, in the document uh, in the table. So you can think about it every match, uh, with every match matching a document, a, a row will get populated. Um, and once you've fully populated the, the view, you can start querying it uh, through SQL and the Optic API. So it's important here to note that we're not doing any transformation on the document. Uh, we're not creating additional data that needs to be managed by the user. Uh, we're not creating metadata uh, on the site. It's all, all that, all that what the templates are doing, they're creating uh, index entries for the columns that you defined. It's all in the indexes. And what that means is that that data or the triples or the rows that you extract through templates travel with the document. Um, and I think that's, that's a very powerful feature and we'll talk later about what that really implies and what are the benefits of having this approach. Um, here, uh, we've expanded, uh, this is, we're taking the same document, but we're looking at projecting a second view. Uh, in this case, it's called the order line. And um, we're going, we, we'd like to populate for every product uh, mentioned in this order, we'd like to populate a row. So we'll add a new template, add a second template, we'll define a different context. In this case, we're interested in matching things that, uh, or matching on the product ID. And for every match, the way the template will work is it will run on the document, and that runs when the document is being ingested or being indexed or being inserted in the database. And for every match, you'll see a row being populated. And now you've got, from the same data, you projected two different uh, views, and you can start doing joins on them. Um, so template-driven extraction is basically data projection into views and triples. Um, once you've done the projections, you can start querying your data or actually look at your documents as uh, through SQL, Sparkle, and the new Optic API. And templates are really built into the uh, database transactional system. And that what, the, what that really means is that uh, when a document is inserted or when a document hits the database, uh, rows are immediately populated uh, and immediately available for query. That makes uh, data provenance very easy. And the triples and the rows that we extract through templates, they know which documents they come from, which allows you to uh, do additional filtering and only pull, for instance, additional uh, filtering on the tables where you can only pull rows from a subset of documents that you're interested in. Uh, so we've seen the case where we can project the same document into many views. Now we're gonna see uh, another use case where we can project, we can take multiple data sources and project in a unified view. And there's also some limited transformation that we can do through the um, uh, templates. For instance, if you had a different fields that describe a date, like a month, a uh, year, and a uh, day, uh, you could, uh, you could uh, uh, add transformations that could construct the date for you and cast it to a, a date and build a column that, that, that date. Um, so here's an example where we have uh, two different entities. Uh, we have a board game document and a game accessory document. And you'll notice first that this is, this is a typical problem with uh, data modeling, is that you almost have the same information expressed in both documents, but it's slightly different. And essentially, the accessories for the game and the game itself are all products. 
So what we really want to do is uh, have a unified view and build a product view so that we can start querying and do um, write the same queries that allows you to um, uh, answer questions about documents that really have different, stru uh, different structures. So you'll add two templates. The first one uh, will run on the board game documents um, and will populate uh, the row. And then the second template will run on the game, will basically uh, apply on the, to the game accessory entities. And it'll, it, the, the first one has to match a game ID in the document, and the second one has to match uh, 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 an ID. And the same way you can extract relational information uh, from your documents, uh, you, can, you can add templates that can create uh, triples in your database. And it's essentially the structure is very similar to what we've seen earlier, except that instead of defining the mapping for the columns, uh, you, can de you can declare how you want to map your subject, your predicate, and your object. And in this situation, we see that there are two keys in the document. Um, uh, and what we want to build, we want to build a relationship between the game accessory and the game it's associated with. So you can see that the uh, expressions here are more complex. You can see that we're doing some concatenation with variables. We're casting it to IRIs. So there's, a, there's a quite a bit of transformation you can do with templates. Um, but it's not, a, it's not an extensive list of uh, functions that's available. And that's for uh, performance reasons. Um, and once you've populated your triples, you can start querying your data through a semantic lens. So the fundamental difference with MarkLogic 8 is that in MarkLogic 8, uh, if you wanted to have triples indexed by the database, you had to express them in a MarkLogic propriety form and then have them embedded in the document so that the indexer can, recogni can recognize them as triples. The fundamental difference here is that you can have your data residing anywhere in your document, and then you can let the template figure out how to construct those triples for you. So now we'll move to a demo. All right. So Firefox. All right. Okay, perfect. So let's first take a look at one of the uh, sample documents uh, for the uh, orders entity. And we just saw the document earlier. <coughs> and we can see there's a list of, where's the scroll bar? Whoops. Ah, here you go. Might be a bug in Query Console. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do you have a, a, a products a document? And we're listing, you have uh, three products in this document. Uh, and it's followed by some information about the customer and the order date. Um, and if you're writing your templates from scratch, the first thing that you'd like, you should be doing, uh, first let's take a look at the template that can populate the order lines from, from this document. Uh, it's been scoped uh, here uh, to uh, collections, orders, and it's, it triggers on a product ID once it matches a product ID in the document. And this is the mapping for the columns where we're describing what to pull from the document and how to construct the different columns. Um, so we, all right. so we can validate the templates. And what the validation will do is we'll check the syntax of the template. We'll check if your context is valid. And most importantly, if you've defined your view in multiple templates, it will do a consistency check that you've defined that, that you have a consistent definition of the view across multiple templates. So the recommended way to building templates is to go through a validation. And then we have a debug API that lets you take a document, the one we just saw earlier, um, and apply the template to see what really gets extracted and to see if the template is really extracting what, what, what's designed for. And in this situation here, uh, we can see that Indeed, this template extracts uh, three rows, and it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Once, once the template is ready, you go ahead and insert it into the database, um, into the schema database. And what the template will do will automatically start populating the view for you in the background. And here we've, we've inserted 
uh, another template to populate the orders view. And we're doing um, a query on the document uh, with ID 600. And here we go. Here we go. Now you can see the populated rows um, from both the orders and the order line. Next, let's take a look at uh, the accessories and the board game uh, entities. And what we'd like to build, we'd like to build a view here uh, using, so you can see how the data is modeled differently, uh, but we can still construct the same view by using the ID, the game ID, um, and SKU title, description, and price, uh, all the common data between the two uh, documents. So we will go and add two templates to the system. The first one will match a game ID in the document and will be applied to a documents in the board games collection. And the second template will match ID and will apply to uh, documents in the accessories collection. Let's go ahead and insert those templates. And now the view, uh, the products view should be populated in the background. And let's start a simple query. And now you can see how we've aggregated different documents with different structures, and we were able to have a unified view of the data. So you can now start writing your queries, uh, the same, exactly the same queries without even knowing how the document looks like. And here we can see uh, we've done some aggregation. Uh, for instance, this is a, a game, and this is a, an accessory for the game. Now let's take a look at the triple uh, extraction case. And this template is a little bit more complex. Um, what we're doing, we're, def we're de defining some variables here. But what we want to build is, if we take a look back at the, if we take go back to the game uh, document, you can see that there's a game ID and an ID. And we would like to build a relationship between the game and its accessories. So here you go. This is, we're building two types of triples. Uh, we're expressing that um, an accessory is uh, an accessory for a specific game. And we're also defining that the current document uh, is also an entity for the accessory. Um, and we'll go ahead and insert the template. Of course, you'll, you'll have to validate it and test it through the uh, node extract function. But here we've done all that work ahead of time. And we'll, we'll insert it. And once we insert the template, we're going to do a, a, a query, a optic API query that will pull uh, all the products and their accessories. And you could do the same in Sparkle, but optic is really cool. <laughs> So here you go. Now we've populated and we created that relationship between the products and the accessories. And now I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Thanks. Thanks, Fayez. So let me switch workspaces here. All right. Okay, so here's uh, an optic query uh, in xQuery, and it's, it's really doing that, that uh, query to find the customer who placed the most, uh, uh, ordered the most products uh, that we looked at conceptually earlier. So you can see we start by defining the views we want to access. We're going to get rows from, for customers, for orders, and for order lines. Uh, so we start, the actual query starts on line seven there. Uh, we start by accessing the customer. We join on the order. Uh, we do so by specifying the primary key of customer and the foreign key for customer in order. Then we do the same thing to join order lines to orders based on the primary key of order and the foreign key of orders in order lines. And then finally, we can group on the customer. 
uh, ID. Uh, we can sample on line 17. Let me scroll up so that, that doesn't get lost in the. Okay. Uh, we can sample the first name and last name for the customer because that will be the same for uh, all of the detail on any customer ID. And we can calculate aggregates. We could calculate uh, the count of distinct orders within the detail, uh, sum up the price of the detail, average the detail, order it. And if we execute this query then, we discover that Kayla Sayers placed the most order and had the largest average price per order. Uh, so we have identified our premier customer. So this is standard relational operations, uh, but expressed in a language integrated way in XQuery. So I also mentioned the use case where the documents have uh, markup that you, or, or properties, structure, substructure that you don't project out into rows. Uh, in this case, it's information supplied by the vendor. So one vendor has detail with equipment uh, level and tagline. Uh, another vendor has features and endorsements. So there's no consistency across the detail. Other cases of document data you might not project would include mixed text where uh, it's a description or uh, metadata uh, that you choose not to put into rows. Regardless, you can still take advantage of that information that's in the documents and not in the rows or triples. So here we are. We, we are accessing products, as you could see. By the way, this is now JavaScript. We've crossed over the border from XQuery to JavaScript. Um, so we're accessing products, and we're getting the products where the detail property within the document, not in the rows, uh, matches a word query on either challenging or surprising. So we're only going to get back rows uh, where the source document matches this query. Um, you'll also notice the fragment ID column. That's a system column, uh, and it has the identifier for the source document when you specify, pass it into from view. So now we're adding a new dynamic column that has the fragment ID. The value of having the fragment ID, the prim primary value, is being able to join the source document into the row. So we're taking the fragment ID column and creating a new dynamic column whose value is source document. Uh, then in the select line, you'll notice we're adding, with the as statement, we're adding another dynamic column uh, called detail. And we're using an X path over the source document to extract the detail node. And that will be the, the value of the, the detail column. And we throw away the, the source document and the fragment ID uh, uh, column. Actually, the fragment ID column is always thrown away. It has no meaning outside the duration of a query. Um, so if we run this query, you can see that we've extracted. Here's our uh, structured information, the SKU title, price, and detail. That was in the rows projected by TDE. And the detail was what we extracted from the document. Um, this also points out, by the way, that um, uh, what we were looking at in XQuery was a nice uh, query console rendering of the tabular information. When you're a programmer working with rows, each row is either an object in JavaScript or a map in XQuery, or it's an array. You can get it in either form. But you're working with a data structure, as you'd expect. OK, for the last example I want to show here is joining uh, on the foreign key that points at any document in the database. So here's the JSON property document that's the source for our rows. 
it has a property that's the document URI of the document we want to join. And that chat uh, property does get projected into the columns uh, of the rows. Not every row will have it, but that's OK. Um, here's the chat transcript. You can see there's nothing row-like about it. It doesn't make any sense as a row. It is a document. So to illustrate the query for that one, I'm going to cross streams yet again. And here we are in Java. Great. OK. So you can see this is Java syntax now. We're in strongly typed Java. But the operations are the same. Uh, the semantics are the same. So we're, we're going to be accessing the customer view because we want to look up uh, the chat transcript for the interactions for, with the customer. And we're going to, to start by selecting the particular customer we're interested in based on last name and first name. Uh, then we're going to do a series of joins through the orders and through the issues to get at the issue history because that's where the chat column exists. The, the chat is associated with an event in the history of resolving an issue. Now that we've got the ch that chat column with the document URI, we can join it, and then we can select. So let's execute that. And here we are starting up Java, and the Java API is creating a uh, connection pool for us to, to get to the server. Um, but here we are, we're getting the uh, result back as XML in this case. You could also get it back as CSV, as JSON. Uh, you can get, when you're joining documents, you can get those back as attachments. There's a map interface and so on. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's a sort of standard. When you get it as XML, it's a standard tabular representation on the client side. Um, so we have headers at the top that tell us the columns and their data types. Uh, and here we have one row uh, with the tabular, or rather the row information, first name, last name, uh, the title, and so on. And in the chat column, we have the document URI. In the transcript column, that was the result of the document join, we have the document. That was the, the XML document that we referred to. So you can pull documents down to the client and process them there. With that, let me go back to the, the slideshow for a few concluding remarks. And first up, Baez will give us a summary. Sure. Um, so with uh, template-driven extraction, uh, we've learned that you can index views and triples. Um, the projections uh, that we do are transactional. And that means when you delete a document, rows and triples get deleted. When you insert a document, the rows and triples are uh, populated immediately. And what that really means is that you can really benefit from all the great features, uh, the enterprise features that MarkLogic is uh, great at. Um, talk about some examples are backup, replication, and failover. Um, and you can almost get it for free. It's very limited. You don't need to do any um, uh, configuration to, uh, to, to make that work. Uh, another aspect that we didn't uh, expand, uh, we didn't explain uh, in details is that the document, if you're familiar with how security works in MarkLogic, the document level security is inherited by the triples and the uh, rows. So if a user cannot see the document, they, ca they will not be able to see the triples and rows extracted from the document. And again, there's no ETL. Uh, it's all in the indexes. Uh, you can have uh, multiple views for, from the same source data. And you could have uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple sources projecting into a single view. And if your, schema if you, if your, if your data schema changes, it's, uh, or um, if you have some new entity types or new uh, different documents that, you, different do documents that are stru structured differently, um, all you have to do is add new templates or modify templates, and that makes managing managing uh, the triples and 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 the uh, rows very very easy. 
Uh, it's really a single document management, and uh, I think this is uh, uh, okay. Uh, and let me summarize about Optic. Um, it's the MarkLogic idiomatic language integrated interface to the engine. Um, and you could access rows, triples. Actually, you could access range indexes too, we, although I didn't show that, but it's similar. Uh, gives you relational operations, including joins, grouping, and aggregates. Also gives you document-oriented operations, including constraining queries, document joins, as we saw, XPath extraction. You can actually dynamically construct documents out of the indexes or a mix of uh, extracted nodes. We didn't get into that. Um, so for our demo exercise, the goal of this was to help the game maker transform themselves uh, into really an integrated organization where they could have a higher level of customer engagement. The whole point of this stuff is not the how interesting the technology it is. It's how interesting the applications are. It's what you people do with it. So with that, we'd like to open it up for some questions. Um, let me see, we have a, do we have a microphone for questions? Yeah, why don't you hold on to that one? Right. Thanks. Oh. Thank you. We'll, we'll bring it up. So. Yeah, I yeah. was looking at uh, the example for the template-driven uh, ex extraction. Yes. And it, it looks like um, one of, is it replacing the current uh, curl scripts for like creating the SQL views? Um, does it look like the example that you showed looked very similar to, you know, using a uh, curl script to create a uh, SQL view? Well, if you're using a curl script, you'll be generating additional documents, right? Additional data. Um, and the fundamental difference here is that we're not we're not we're not extracting because if the alternative would be you'll have to generate documents that contain a table and you have to pull that out of your documents um, and you'll have to manage and worry about you know transactions and you have to manage um, the documents that all documents and keep keep them in sync all the time so that's all handled by by TDE for you by the template-driven extraction. It's all in the index, it's transactional, um, so you don't have to worry about um, managing that da man managing all the triples that you're extracting manually. Uh, it's a fundamental difference between the two approaches. Uh, now, if I currently have curl scripts, could they still continue to be used for MarkLogic 9? Well, well, curl, you're curl asking about curl? Curl, curl or curl? Yeah. Curl, curl. C-U-R-L. Uh, so curl, still works against REST interfaces. Yeah. There, there is, so are, is the question about the, the definition of SQL views in Mark yeah. Logic 8? Yeah, like creation yeah. of yes. SQL views. Yeah, so that, that, those continue to exist and be supported. Okay. But the recommended approach is definitely TDE. Um, so we had a question up here, so it, did that answer the question though? Yeah, okay. Okay, for the, the templates, the TDE, um, you specified there was a context, right, that says where in the document to start. Um, if we're doing it on an XML document, does that support full XPath? So can I say only do products where the company name is Hasbro? Right, right. so if you're familiar with what an indexable path is in MarkLogic, you can definitely use predicates. Um, in, yeah, you, you, can, you can definitely do that. Okay. It's pretty powerful, it's okay. pretty powerful. Sub documents meaning the uh, element levels. Uh, right, we're um, it's not comp fully supported in Mark Logic Nine, but what we do is we uh, we have a mode where if we detect that an element uh, has been protected. Um, we have, uh, we don't extract it unless the document security is actually stronger than the element security. Um, it's not completely supported, uh, but we have, we have, we're working on some ideas uh, about how to implement that in the future because this question came up quite a few times uh, before. Also, 
also being updated? As right, right. It's, it's automatically updated, yes, yes, okay. immediately. And that, that goes to the same database as the documents on, or it could go separately? It, the uh, index, it's, it's all managed in the server, um, and it's in memory. Um, no, is it this part of the same database that the documents are in? So templates are in stored in the schema database. Uh, not in the document database, unless you set up. Right. The, the but, this is, but the index itself is always right, in right, the right. same database. Right, right, right. The index is in the same the database document. as, as your documents. Database. Correct, yeah, correct. Absolutely. Yes. Right. So, uh, I think in, you, you were first. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I was asking uh, the impact to the performance because it is template driven approach. If I have the base documents which are huge in size, a lot of documents, I, I put templates, complex templates on top of it. Uh, in your experience while building the product, um, have you have, is there any benchmark that you have done? Or that results published outside. We're working. Uh, we're working on creating more performance tests. But the when we did the initial testing, uh, it did not exceed 10 percent. There's a lot more going on when you ingest the document. It did not exceed 10 percent overhead uh, by adding templates. Of course, that depends on the complexity of the templates. What we do with them, and um, if whether you're extracting one column or 10 columns, um, whether your document has. Uh, thousand elements but you're only interested in extracting two el you know two columns from 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 that so there's different factors uh, but we, we didn't we didn't see any overhead and for the next release we're actually building uh, more performance stats to see where we stand at uh, but it, it was never an issue so far ingestion was never an issue with templates Question. Yeah. Hi, um, does the optics API support any aggregate based functions like um, some yeah, so, like so Optic supports uh, the aggregate function supported are kind of the standard ones, min, max, count, uh, average, sum. Um, you know, we would like to expand the set of aggregates in the future. There is a hack you could do which uh, works for smaller data sets, which is uh, the math library is supported, and that uh, operates on sequences. Optic can aggregate detail into a sequence. So that gives you a very rich set of libraries to calculate uh, aggregates over sequences that where it's small enough to fit in memory rather than being an index. So if you have a sequence, can you pass it to like a, your custom X query module or something like that? Is that how you do the aggregation? So, so uh, there is no support for custom X query within Optic. What there is support for is the uh, built-in functions uh, that uh, are side effect free transforms. So things like the math aggregates where they take a sequence and return a number. Uh, and much of the FN library is supported, uh, things like that. So in practice, that means it, I think there's 350 functions available so there is a rich function library available for transformation of values within an optic plan. Yeah, question. Kind of on an, uh, another question that was asked about kind of where things are stored. It, if I understood correctly, uh, all of the triples or the data structures that are underneath the triples for the columns are managed automatically when you define a template, Correct. and that they appear and then disappear based on the document. Is that something that is, is that based on something that's new in MarkLogic 9 that's now built in, or is that built on something like triggers, or how well does I, that I, work? I, I can Just take generally. this. Sure, well, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, actually, the guy who could really take it is sitting Let's a few rows back. But anyway, uh, so uh, the big difference is in, in MarkLogic, um, seven and eight, uh, triples were only generated from well-recognized XML and JSON formats. So you had to actually encode the triples within the document. But they were always managed in an index, always projected out of the document into an index. The big difference in MarkLogic 9 is you now have the flexibility to completely control how those triples are projected out of the documents. But the fundamental 
representation of triples in the index has not changed. And when you delete a document, how does it know to get rid of the triples? Because it, it just it just seems like because triples are associated with documents. That's the same. It's how it, index. It's it, it's, it's the same it's thing that uh, because of the association between triples and documents. That's the, the same reason a document query can constrain triples or rows because every triple is associated with a document. Okay, thank you. Sure. In the same respect, so even the template driven will do unmanaged triples or just managed triples. If there is an unmanaged triples in my database, yes. can can I combine them with the template? Uh, template? Yeah, sure. They will still work. It's uh, it's backward compatible. You you can combine them. Yes. Uh, You mean the collation lexicon? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's still support. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we've run out of time, apparently. Uh, but thanks for coming for the talk, and please. Okay.